I'd like to introduce uh, old friends and colleagues, Clifton Metter and Emily McFarish, uh, who to me are two of really the greatest uh, book artists working today, but then I'm prejudiced because I like both of them very much as well, but they are great book artists. Emily is a writer, designer, and book artist who lives and works in San Francisco. Her work, published by Granary Books in New York, is in the collections of many major museums and libraries. Her writing on design has been featured in Visible Language and Design and Culture. Uh, a second edition of Graphic Design History, a critical guide which she co-wrote and designed with uh, Johanna Drucker, was published by Prentice Hall in 2012. She's Associate Professor of Graphic Design, Design and Writing at California College of the Arts. Clifton Metter's work incorporates writing, photography, printmaking, and design to produce artist books that explore culture, history, and place. Metter's artist books have been exhibited widely and are held in many major collections. He was director of Nexus Press in Atlanta from 1985 to 1988, taught at SUNY uh, New Paltz uh, from 1994 to 2005, and was director of the MFA in book and paper at Columbia College Chicago from 2005 to 2014. He is now professor and chair of the Department of Art at Appalachian State University. And um, the books that they're gonna be talking about uh, are both featured in our new exhibition in the Reva and David Logan Gallery upstairs. And um, so you can see those both in the flesh as well as on screen today. So please welcome Emily and Cliff. Does this work? So I thought I'd explain what we're going to do first. Uh, I've seen a lot of artist talks, so have you. I thought it'd be much more interesting to have two people interview each other about their work. So we prepared a list of questions about each other's work, and it's a kind of interview format, and this is an experiment. <laughs> um, first, I do. I think Amaranth did an excellent job of thanking everybody. So. Um, what she said. Um, in particular, though, Steve Woodall for um, in inviting me and for arranging um, for the program today. It's been really um, stimulating, really substantive, and a little bit like I could have. It could have ended uh, for me during the break. We saw so many interesting projects, and um, I guess the only um, upside to having another. <laughs> another act at the end is that we're going to slow it down. So we saw like maybe a hundred books um, amongst all the presentations. We're just going to look at two um, for a while, so hopefully it'll be worthwhile. Um, I'm particularly grateful to have a chance to talk with uh, Clifton Metter, whose work I've admired for years. As an artistic medium, books are capable of supporting of staging, structuring, developing, conveying complex experiences and meanings. In fact, once the expressive potential of the format is considered, which it rarely is, um, the compositional possibilities can be overwhelming. I've always been drawn to ideas and associations that defy simple, singular statement. So I guess it makes sense that I've been attracted to artist books but I often fail in my own pursuit of the richness that books are capable of, and I rarely see books by others that meet my expectations of the medium. All of Cliff's books that I've had the privilege of viewing have exceeded um, my expectations. They've demonstrated possibilities I couldn't even have imagined. I'm not sure why, um, the artistic ambition and the creative wealth and the conceptual reach of Cliff's books inspires me rather than paralyzes me. Um, but I think maybe it's because they're generous in the ideas that they offer and they're, they're light-hearted in their refinement, uh, sorry, light-handed in their refinement. And they manage to be earnest even as they're sophisticated. I consider Cliff to be a master of the form whose mastery is shown in the doors his work opens rather than in any definitive attainment. 
So that's my general appreciation of Cliff. It's, that's uh, really generous of you because I feel the same way about it. <laughs> it's a mutual admiration uh, society, I guess. But So we, th we thought we'd ask a few general questions first. And let me ask you the first one. Okay. So you're one of the very few people where writing and the realization of that writing through design, typography, and vis visual language is so central to the work you do. Can you talk about why you're drawn to making that kind of work? Uh, yeah, okay, so I think there's, there's, there's a short answer and a long answer, and I think we, we better stick to the short yeah, answer. Stay, stay short. Um, we have a lot to talk about. The short answer, I think, is something of a uh, contradiction. So on the one hand, I, I'm a fetishist. I want to hold on to meaning. I want meaning to be something I can hold on to, something that um, I can awaken and reawaken from an invested object. But on the other hand, I'm the product of uh, the ideas that I studied in college. Amherst, um, refer, and everybody in one way or another has referred to this idea that actually meaning is something that's produced um, in the encounter between a reader and words on the page. And so I think somewhere in bet between my desire for adherence and my interest in staging that encounter between a reader and stuff on a page, that's, that's where my motivation for making this kind of work lies, I think. I, I just want to get into the questions asking you about this piece already, but let's keep on with this. No, no, thing. hang on, hang on. I want to ask you, okay. Well, maybe I should sit down, though, because I, I think yeah, with this, this, this part we can both sit down. Could, could you speak louder? Yeah, can you hear me? I'll use the mic better. So, uh, hang on, it's my turn, I think. Isn't it? it. This ahead. is the, uh, is, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I have a similar question for you. You are, I think, the only um, photography-based offset book artist I know whose work seems equally rooted in writing and who experiments with typographic design to extend that writing and uh, create shared spaces between text and image. And so I wanted to ask you about that. Like, is that is that space between text and image what fundam fundamentally attracts you to the form, or you know, how did you get started making artist books, and why have you kept it up? Well, I started as a photographer more than anything else, and I was making groups of photographs. I was more interested in a body of photographs than individual images. Mm. And I had a teacher in art school who said, "You know, there's a technology for that. It's called a book." <laughs> so I started making groups of photographs as books. And it wasn't long before the stories that you can tell with photographs are so unlocated, they free float in a funny way, that I wanted to put writing with them. And as a kind of a southerner, there's a storytelling thing that's always going on in my mind. So I wanted to pick writing with the pictures, but they don't work well together. Right. Right? Photographs and, and language just fight each other the whole time. So I actually got really interested in that. And that's part of what I've been looking at the whole time is how do you negotiate that fight between a written, the visual form of language and a photographic representation? Right. Yes. Yeah, me too. I want to get into the particulars of, yeah, of, right. the, of the book. Yeah. Let's get there. It's a race to the actual books. I so I wanted to ask you, how pre-visualized is your work? And this will come up later when we're looking at it. Okay. So how pre-visualized is my work? Which is a, a question, a fair question for a letterpress uh, printer. Anybody who's done any letterpress printing, um, if you're working with metal type and setting it by hand and proofing it in order to see what it it's going to look like. That's a long um, process. And on the one hand, I really love that. I love about in pr any printmaking process the, the kind of semi-blindness of the initial investment in an idea, the fact that you, you kind of get into the thing without really knowing um, what it's going to look like. Um, so I like that, and I like the slowness of it. I like the suspension of judgment that happens when you're building something in a letterpress shop. On the other hand, um, design, insofar as it's like a, an alternation between creative and critical practice, is better served by, you know, um, iteration, iterative, um, less attachment, less investment. And so I've tried over the years to develop methods of, you know, going back and forth between, for example, I'll choose a I'll say, maybe I'll use this typeface, maybe I'll use it in this way, and I'll try to proof a sample of that, bring it home, scan it, and then recreate it digitally so that I can work with that idea quickly, print that out, bring it back if I like it, and then, you know, hand set that. So it's this kind of loop. 
basically. And to answer your question, um, I guess there's a little of blindness and there's a little, you know, there are moments of pre-visualization, but I'm more interested in a way, like, I've, I, in another, another way of answering that is I've been working with the same stuff for years, kind of like the shop that Daniel described. I only have so many typefaces, you know? I mean, I have more than three, but um, it's a finite uh, kind of resource. And I can imagine to some extent what it's going to look like, my, whatever my idea is. But I'm not interested, I'm not interested actually in, in my own plans, ultimately. <laughs> and the best ideas I have come out of accidents that I later restage as experiments, right? So that's another level of not pre-visualizing. And in, in a way, anyway, so I see the value in both. I see the value in not, you know, not knowing in accidents and, and in, mis you know, discoveries. And, I, and I see, when it comes to actually design, I can see the value in, and I try to f develop ways to pre-visual, or to visualize what I'm doing. So I, you that's just, not a very good answer. No, it's a great answer. You gave me a, this incredible window into your practice there. <laughs> and you did, you did something a way I would never do. You said, I'm interested in a typeface. I take a proof of it. Yeah. I take it home. I scan it. I make a digital version of it so you can manipulate it in a computer. You know, I just look for a digital typeface that kind of looked the same. No, I didn't, I don't really, no, I can't, I don't really, no, 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 I do. But there's I, a level of detail yeah. in that answer that talked about the kind of precision in your practice. It's really interesting. I'm thinking about that book, Quiver. Flicker. Flicker. It was yeah. one of those words. Yeah, I like Quiver, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so where you printed the feet of the type. Yeah. And that blew my mind away. The idea that you would actually set all this tiny type upside down and then print it to see what it looked like. Was <laughs> the first version of that was in six point yes, type, so right. six that point. was tiny. So a field like this in six point type. And thousands of yeah, yeah. pieces, yeah. So that's a very you impressive. You can tell thing. I'm compulsive and, and uh, I like rep and, repetitive behavior. Yeah, so. thank, thank goodness. <laughs> Did, is there, there's some kind of receptor that way. All right, I'll talk this way. Um, so let's talk about lessons of darkness. Uh, Emily McVarish's books are incredibly subtle, complex, and richly typographic works, and carefully crafted. Uh, this latest book, uh, published by Granary Books this year, serves as a visual score for a meditation on what the absence of media saturation might offer. So when I was reading this uh, work, I understood it to be a deep reflection on the nature of our addiction to screens, uh, the, and the losses we suffer from that addiction, as well, as well as wondering what we might gain from uh, less screen time. And let me just say that that is a gross oversimplification of what this work actually offers. It's hard to show a book on a screen and have you get anything out of it. But there's so many threads, so many levels to this book, it's, it repays uh, deep reading. One of the great pleasures of the doing this thing we just did was I got to really stare at this book for a long time and think about it and get to ask her questions about it. So in terms of reading a book, I've had a, an amazing experience. The affordances of an artist book offer these tremendous opportunities for complexity, and that's one of the things that really marks your work, is a deep complexity of meaning and expression with a text and with a visual experience. So, uh, Lessons of Darkness is, is strongly related, I think, to a Baroque musical composition, uh, Francois Couperin's Trois Leçons de Tenebre. This musical work is intended for performance as part of the Catholic rite of Tenebrae, uh, a rite that was uh, eliminated by Vatican II. And that's a, that's a series of Holy Week services that are observed over three days. Um, Couperin wrote music for all three nocturnes, but only, only these three lessons have survived from the first night. And this service is marked by a gradual extinction of candles during the service. So they're slowly putting out candles during the service till the entire uh, congregation ends in darkness. So the church is, ends in darkness and all the, uh, the worshipers are, are sitting there, I guess, and leaving. The libretto for these lessons is the first chapter of the Book of Lamentations, which is a poem that mourns the destruction of Jerusalem. You know, in other books, you've explored the impact of personal screens on culture. One of the themes of the book, The Square, that you did is uh, the kind of uh, destruction of the uh, commons, is the way I understood it, a, a public shared experience. The service of Tenebrae is a ritual lamentation for the loss of a city. Can you talk about your process in exploring Couperin's lessons with your artistic interest in this theme? 
Yeah. Um, okay. So I had been listening to Couperin's um, Lessons of Darkness for years um, before I looked into um, the origin of the music. Um, and what I just I discovered um, some of what you just described about you know what its religious purpose and occasion was. Um, and initially. When I heard that, that when I read that the, the text was um, taken from Jeremiah's lamentations on, over the destruction of Jerusalem, I thought, oh, well, this, is, this could be a fitting text. I'm feeling a certain despair over the cultural impact of kind of a, the boom, economic boom um, on San Francisco. And I thought, oh, well, I'll look to this text and see, like, what, what, what is it? But when I did, I I just, I didn't, in the end, I wasn't interested ultimately in um, assuming the position of the kind of uh, inconsolate citizen of a forsaken city, you know, in lamentable condition. I just, I didn't actually, wasn't interested in that. But, but what I discovered was that the, which is very common, um, I think, common to other parts of the Bible and certainly to other ancient texts, that the, the verses are um, composed according to a really basic mnemonic, which is an acrostic scheme, in this case the most, the simplest acrostic, which is um, each verse begins with um, the following, the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And in fact, it turned out that the, the parts of Couperin's music that I liked the best, um, what were melismas, which is to say, like, um, their vocalizations, in this case, of those, the names of those Hebrew letters, so of, like, in some cases, single syllables over multiple notes. So there, it's a kind of, um, there you go. So you see at the top, those two syllables, Daleth, go over all those notes. And, um, I, I thought, oh my God, it's the alphabet, and it's not this nonverbal, you, you know, unpacking of the letters. That's amazing. Like, there are these kernels, these elements, and yet they're just it's somehow this kind of exploration, this musical exploration of the space of the letter. I thought, well, this is, I've got to do something with this. And I, I thought initially it would be a visual exploration, an unfolding of some, somehow of, of the letter forms themselves. But in the end, that idea didn't last very long either, and what I ended up doing was taking the musical, if you go back, go back to the, taking the musical form of those melismas as a structure to write into, as kind of like a mold for writing. And um, it would take too long probably to describe the process, but um, I basically, came up, I listened to those melismas over and over and over again, wrote down a kind of reductive blank scheme that represented um, long and short, you know, long and short and medium notes. Yeah, that's it, okay, so, and, and anyway, I, I don't know if I should keep going on about this. So it was a, it was a kind of, um, so I'm, a, I'm asking the question because there's an expressive piece of typography running in a band, uh, one band down across the page. And it's a theme that goes through the whole book. That space is sort of preserved throughout the whole structure of the book. And there's a poem she's written that runs along the bottom of the page that uh, is typographically expressed in that band. How am I doing? Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. Very good. Although the poem was written in the top form and then more like transcribed in the bottom form. Really? Yeah. That's even more interesting. I mean, in a way, yeah. So let me start with this. The book is divided into three sections. Uh, there are three lessons, and this echoes the form of, uh, of uh, Couperin's uh, composition, the Trois Lessons. Uh, so the lesson one is the darkness of no answer. Lesson two is the darkness of no substitute. And lesson three is the cure of darkness. So it seems like, so I was looking at this and thinking about it, and as you read the poem, you get a much stronger sense of what, this, what the expression is. And it feels like the structure of a logical argument. But it's not a linear piece of writing. There's nothing linear about it. It's very expressive. 
Could you talk about that tension between the logical structure and the expressive reality of the work? Or is that an impossible question? No, no, it's not. It's not impossible. Um, so you mentioned the um, the use of this music in during the three days separating the crucifixion from the resurrection and the, during Holy Week. And so it's sort of a commemoration of a moment of mourning of the apparent death of, of Christ. And the darkness that the that the extinction of the candles um, produces is something that people sat in and reflected, contemplated. And I tried to find like a contemporary equivalent for that. What would the contemporary equivalent for that be? And I, I couldn't. It seemed like the opposite of, I mean, sitting in darkness, contemplating death as something, you know, an infinite loss in this case of, of a god, but uh, the unknowability of death and the unfathomable loss of, of, of life, I thought what, that is the opposite of wanting to know and checking our phones and needing to constantly be connected, that we would be incapable of, you know, we, broadly speaking. Um, and so it started, the text started with that idea that um, we experience darkness when we experience disconnection mm -hmm. and the desired outcome of an interaction doesn't happen. And so I started writing, when I first started writing into those forms that, that I kind of derived from the musical phrasing, which were just syllabic sort of scores, um, I started writing, you know, words that fulfilled the, the kind of duration of notes in, in those um, phrases. The first part of the text was really about that. It was about um, moments of failed communication and foiled interaction, moments of disconnectivity as a kind of um, like rug being pulled out from under us and a certain experience of darkness. I thought that's what the text was going to be about. But the more that I worked on it, I, th and then I thought the, other, the flip side of that was kind of what you, what you said in your introduction that the flip side of that was going to be what happens if we intentionally disconnect? What will we reconnect with in ourselves? What, ki what kind of capacity for reflection might we have if we intentionally disconnect? So that was sort of the second part of the text. But my discovery, and to be honest, I, I literally um, I literally walked around whenever safe during while I was working on this with my eyes closed just to see what would happen if I shut off the sense, sight, that always sort of assumes it knows its object. And shut it off, what happens? Well, first thing that happens is your other senses, particularly hearing, you know, are enhanced. But the other thing that I thought would happen, that somehow my thoughts would come to the surface and then become, you know, I would become reflective or, you know, have some have some awareness of my own state or something, that proved much more elusive than I thought. And so the, sec the second part of the text ended up being about that kind of inner blind spot that actually we're dark to ourselves. And there's a kind of fundamental unknowability of the self. It's not as simple as, you know, sitting and quietly and thinking. So that's the second part of the text. And then the third part of the text is sort of ultimately about trying to let go of the need to know. And um, so anyway, that's the sort of movement of the text. And the titles that you referred to, it's a long answer to your question. Mm -hmm. The titles came after the text was written. Mm -hmm. They do a few things. They, um, they tie the individual texts that were the product of each letter. So the phrasing from each letter produced a separate text. But those letters introduce parts of Couperin's score that are actually grouped into the lessons, right? Mm -hmm. So the sections of the book and the titles regroup the texts according to the lessons to which they belong in the music. Mm -hmm. And they sort of name the shifts in the theme of the, of the text. Um, 
yeah, and sort of show how the lessons and the themes map onto the book. I think that's a good overview of the structure of the book. I think, I hope that made some sense. <laughs> so the book starts with this line. This is at the bottom of this, this uh, thing. A dark time on a screen, no answer comes. How shell breath can be, no answer comes. So I hear an addict's terror in this line, a strangulation from absence. This is how the whole book opens. And it's a great stage setting for this whole book for me, uh, which builds images of the futility of this kind of experience. And I, some, uh, some other lines from the book that I think build this theme. A holes in the stream spin a charm's colors for now. How to bring a slack debt home. I'm probably reading that really differently than you do. And mm -hmm. another one, uh, conjecture roams. Extinction floats, trivial as a shadow stage. Your name spans from scratch to trouble's edge. That's particularly evocative to me. Uh, so that brings me to my, my next question. The, the text has a particular quality to it. Could you talk about your writing technique? Yeah, so I, um, the way that I write is to cut up text and um, store the words that I've collected on pasteboards so I have like an inventory of possible words. And then when I'm ready, when I've cut enough text, I figure, um, then I go back and compose physically taking words from those boards and um, kind of like letterpress, they're, they're really closely uh, in some ways related. They're like these physical interactive ways of building a text. So it's kind of a concrete, somewhere between pretty abstract, like I don't start with, I need to say this, how, how best to say it. I start with like, well, language is a system that's gonna produce meaning no matter what I do. So um, let's start playing around with that and see <laughs> what meaning is produced. So it's a kind of space that's not directly accessible by intention, but it's more like a position of being responsive to the language as this sort of stuff and a structure that I'm working with. So you build a controlled vocabulary. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So and in this case, I had a whole second set of controls, which was these, this syllable scheme, which told me I need a word that's one syllable, that's, that's a long syllable, like home, you know, for this uh -huh. to fill this space. And then I need a, a word that's got three short syllables to, to fill this ta -ta -ta space. So it was like actually super constrained and really f a lot of fun. It was a great prompt. So the example I'm showing right now is the, the melodic structure first and then the writing that fits into that melodic structure. And there's something funny happening over there on the right-hand side of the screen. Which is the only mistake I made in the, in the book. No. Yeah, it is, yeah. Really, that you looks chose so to me. Yeah. I mean, I I'm not it saying it's totally the only would. mistake I made, but it's the only moment I made that's false in relation to the, the notes, and so I had to... Yeah. We're gonna move on now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, so I have one more thing. Oh, yeah, I want it's time for me to answer. No, no, I wanna ask you one more thing here. Okay. So in this lesson two, The Darkness and No Substitute, you switch from this typographic expression to uh, photographic imagery. Uh, Multicolor images of building at night uh, into this aerial view of people standing in a public square, which is iterated a bunch of different times. Now these are close-ups. Those are, that's a page spread, and then there are two close-ups of the people who seem like it's the same photograph. It's just the same photograph over and over again. Over yeah. and over again. So could you talk about, and this I guess will be my last question, is how photography and typography function for you in this work? Um, yeah, so I guess the first thing to say is there's less integration between the text and the image in this book than in most of my work. Um, the photographs, okay, so in a way, the whole text takes place in someone's head. And the, I think the photographs function in relation to the text variously as they might be peripheral perceptions, they might be associations, they might be memories, they might be figures of thought. Um, and in the second section, the section you're in here, they are sort of, they, they don't change, they just alternate, they kind of, the colors shift, and they're, the, the shifts in, in the, which screens of the CMYK color, you know, process color I used in any given iteration of the image 
so they kind of bring different color, different amounts of color into the, into the repeated image. It's really just meant to evoke shifts in state um, and to suggest that like nothing external is changing. It's the same image, but there's some shift in state. So they, I guess, to answer your question, um, photographs operate in different ways in relation to the text. In relation to the type, very, they're, very, they're quite separate. And the only kind of interim language, I think, between type and image in this um, is the, the line art. All, all of those, um, so I, I, all the line work, with the exception of that scheme, which is text, which is type on its feet. But all the finer line work is from a bike map of um, Manhattan. Um, yeah, that those that those figures, those kind of abstract um, line art, are this sort of interim space maybe between t like a typographic line and a photographic, you know, form or I mean an image. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I answered your question, but not really. Not really. <laughs> no, but that's good. Getting you talking about it's very interesting. <laughs> so here's one of the great frustrating things about this little experiment is I have another five pages of questions. Uh, that I'd like to ask you, but, but we're going no, to switch. We're going to switch to your book, which I also have five pages of questions about. I had um, the same pleasure of spending um, a few days with Cliff's book. Um, actually, Cliff, tell me how to say the title. Pankisi Prayer Rug. Pankisi Prayer Rug. I need to know that comes up a lot in my questions. Um, so, so the first thing to say about this book is it's it's inventive. In fact, it was just it psyched me out when I first started really looking at it. It was just endlessly inventive, um, and you can see that um, right off the bat before you even open it. Um, the this is the front cover. There's no title. Instead, you get this full bleed uh, photograph. In this case, of the you know you can see what it's of of, of, a, of a road looking out through the windshield from the front seat of a car. This is the version of the cover that I chose because if I remember, even the cover design was prolific. There were multiple photographic versions of the book to choose from. Can, can I? Yeah, jump so in any time. Uh, John Demerit and Nora Powell who published this, that was their idea. Was it? Yeah, we had a lot of leftover press sheets of certain pages. <laughs> and they said, let's make six different covers. Oh, it was a great idea. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, so, but the thing is, you know, as soon as you do open the book, it's like the inventiveness just does not stop. Every time you turn the page, there's another um, graphic scheme that's capable of incorporating another conceptual layer. It's just an incredibly rich, um, rich book. And one of the most thrilling aspects of the book to me is that it, um, in it, one medium's idiom is apt to be borrowed by another idiom, tried on for size. Like, for example, in the photographs, isolated elements are kind of called out in, by um, their color, and they become these sort of icons. Um, and in some cases, literally, images get lifted out of the photographic space and operate as signs on the one hand. And on the other hand, you've got that the treatment of text is, follows this sort of zonal um, logic that echoes the, the, the areas in the photographs across the gutter. And that resonance across media is just one expression of a kind of integrative, um, integrative drive that for me makes the book so compelling. Um, so Pankisi Prayer Rug evokes a place, the Pankisi Gorge region of Georgia. Georgia being ex-Soviet Georgia, not... You know, they don't call it Georgia. They don't call it Georgia. What do they call it? Sakartvelo. Okay, I can't say that. Um, this, okay, so the evocation draws on observations made at two autobiographical moments, I think. Is that right? Two yes, moments in your right, own right. past. And then it, it incorporates multiple um, historical contexts. And basically the book juxtaposes um, the intimate textures of daily life and the media-distorted violence of geopolitical conflicts that happen in and around this area. So individual life on the one hand and the sort of strains of history on the other. And the book asks how, in the relationship between those two, how to tease out meaningful threads and see determinant patterns. And 
Many of the book's explorations of this question involve the relationship between composition and scale of perception. And in this, oh, the organ's starting. Oh my God, we gotta get there, okay. Um, in this relationship, I see a connection between the book's metaphoric structure, which builds most notably um, through recurrences of the image of, of a rug, and its narrative foregrounding of point of view. Alignment. This is, I'm going to stop talking about the book and ask you some questions, but alignment seems to play a key role in the pursuit of both of these aesthetic projects. So verbal and visual alignment serves to link and group content to create um, defined zones and set terms in the book. The point being that once boundaries have been set, what, once definitions have been established, then incursion can occur. And it occurred to me in looking at this book multiple times that incursion of one context into another or one meaning into another offered a model for thinking about how something like geopolitical circumstances might invade a personal space, how violence can erupt in a quiet spot, and how the past can reassert its claims in the present. Okay, so in the prospectus for the book, which I read, you say that Pankisi Prayer Rug is a celebration of the materiality of the book. I loved that. So what I want to talk with you about is how, how this materiality makes different kinds of orchestration possible in the book. And I want to start with, so it's basically like, I want to look at all the, the ways that you use the book as an or that you approach the book as being capable of integrating different uh, registers. So starting with um, the, your, the tendency in the book to integrate photographic space and the space of the page. Um, let's see if I can give some examples of what I mean. So basically throughout the book, there's the, the, the photographs are full bleeds, which kind of means the edge of the page is also the edge of the image. Those two are per perfectly coincide. Sometimes you engage the gutter in a way that really calls attention to the gutter as a doubling space. I mean, the, the depth of the, you know, the depth of the uh, two-page opening is really often in play with the depth, um, the depth represented in the images. So could you just talk a little bit about what, what kinds of intentions you had in rhyming and conflating photographic space and, and the so space the, of the page. One of the things I don't want to ever happen is that the photograph becomes a window in the, in the page. And so often in photographic books, a, uh, a photograph is this kind of window into another space outside the book. As somebody who's very interested in books, uh, I want the reader's experience to be located in the book itself, in that moment of holding this thing. And when I talk about the materiality of a book, that's what I mean is the, uh, the affordances of the book, not the richness of the materials or anything else, but just the fact that it's a codex form and these pages turn and it's inescapably with the memory of the page before it that you read a book unless you're like Steve and read the book from the back to the front. It's another matter. <laughs> but there's lots of things that's fun to do when you have that kind of idea of space. So the, the doubling of the, of the rug here is supposed to suggest a book. Right. So the, and the idea that the rug is a book is part of the deeper metaphor of the whole book, right. which is this prayer rug uh, theme of uh, asking a question of what is a prayer rug for and how do you use it? So, and that's supposed to relate to the bigger theme that geopolitical conflict uh, depends on your point of view. Right. So I got that right, the, yeah. the, the point of view thing. You're so, great so, so the, in a way, what you just said about you want it not to be a window, but to be, you know, the affordance of the book object itself. That's, that, I love that basically the way that a photograph position's point of view gets embedded in this object that I'm holding. And so uh, the orientation of the object, the dimensions of the object, the limits of the object, the object being the book, um, are sort of operative in my relationship to, to the image. And the image might position me inside, outside, close, far, but all of those experiences are coming through the object of the book. Um, so that, that's, yeah, super cool. Um, okay, so another kind of integration that I was really um, interested in in looking at the book is, has to do with the way that it achieves narrative and poetic movement through direct engagement with the sequential 
nature of the book, the sequential structure of the book. So point of view is mobilized. I see these figures as being sort of um, figure, figure, these figures that, these are, by the way, the first, the first pages, really, of the book, once you get past the preliminary pages. Um, they lead us closer to the structure, into the building, and I could go on, but there's this very real sense in, um, in the sequence of, that we're moving with these figures. So you use sequence to mobilize point of view. You also use it as a way to, um, like for the symbolic meaning of something like the rug, to be able to shift from one link in a chain of association to another. And I just wanted to talk to you for a moment about sequence. It's fundamental. It's like fundamental to the formal, you know, to the form of the book. So if you could just talk a little bit about how you think about sequence and how you work with sequence. Um, and then how do you, like, how, like, just practically, how do you build up? Because you're, you're, you've, got, you've got multiple things going on at any given time with sequence. Not, not always, but often. So how, how do you build up the kind of layers of sequential effect? How do you do that? How do you visualize it? Same way you do that. <laughs> so uh, when I'm photographing, I'm always looking for uh, photographic sequences. I think like a filmmaker when I'm shooting photographs. So the idea is that I shoot a lot of sequences that are, imitate walking. And the form of the Codex book particularly suggests walking to me, the turning of the pages, mimics taking steps, so I'm thinking as I shoot sequences of this kind of pace in a sequence of walking. So this particular first part is exactly walking into this family's mosque. So the loose structure, this, the narrative structure, this part of this book is, I, uh, we go to this sort of place that used to be dangerous, so they told me it was part of the war on terror. Uh, a family invites us to go into their family mosque. We walk in there. And during the course of that, we all start to realize that there's no war on terror here. These are not... Uh, Al-Qaeda people, these are just people struggling to make a living, and their family mosque is this sort of modest place that has these interesting ties to history in it. So the sequence, bu I build up sequences through photography, mm -hmm. and then that becomes a kind of backbone for a book structure, and then the other stuff that I want to include, the other narrative elements like history, uh, personal reflection, get layered on top of that. Right. Well, it's, it's very powerful, the, the, the photographic sequence as a as a way to pull in the other layers. So one thing I was particularly interested in, okay, so there's, there, the, pa the book is not only composed sequentially page to page, like page turn to page turn, but there's this other level of sequential composition that happens in like by sections, it seems to me. There's like visual chapters. They're not marked like mine were, but there, but are. there are definitely um, sort of visual sections to the book. And so there's, there's sequential composition at that level too, where like a whole sequence becomes a segment that gets placed in an order, right? And I just wanted to show, I can't, didn't do a very good job photographing this because I don't have the, photo, the spreads before and after, but w one of the most dramatic uses of sort of sequence at this, at this level of whole, whole sections being um, sequenced is comes in right in the center Am I right? It's like right in the center of the book, in the sixth signature. Yeah. There, all of a sudden, the images um, shift. They're obviously lifted from another medium, from another source. They look like blown up video stills, and they're so there's like blow up is like you know a, a kind of horrible pun in this because they're about they're, they represent it looks to me like the a tank being blown up. And so this is a sequence that happens sort of in real time. I mean, insofar as these are video stills that seem to be split seconds apart. And so the pace changes, the voc visual terms change, all of a sudden, poof, in the middle of this book that was, had a certain aesthetic, everything looks different, everything acts differently. And then at the end of this sequence, the, the, the following spread, there's a text that reads, um, Images of, let's see if I can find it. Uh, I can't find it. Uh, yeah, images of violence and war are ubiquitous threads in our lives. So it's, it's like a direct reference to what we just experienced. It's this moment that the, the book stages as this sort of like shocking exposure to something and then it manages to reflect on something that it just caused us to experience. So I just... Um, I guess, 
I just want, maybe I'm just pointing out, but I also want to ask you about, you say you work up sequence through, you know, starting with photographs and then wanting to pull in these other um, dimensions, but I think you're working with sequence like a, I don't know, like a composer working with, an, you know, an orchestra, you're working on so many levels at once. And I'm just curious, how do you, when I said how do you do that, I meant like how do you lay it all out and see what's it gonna be like? Is it gonna have the effect I think it is gonna have when all of a sudden there's these four openings in the middle of the book that do something completely different? Uh, it was just sort of a gamble to see if it worked. I make lots of dummies like you do, like hundreds and hundreds of dummies, try things out. This uses a funny printing technique that I've been curious about for a long time. Uh, it's a straight line screen, mm -hmm. and it, they're at angles. Huh. And I'd wanted to do that because in the history of four-color printing, the first process four-color reproductions were done with a straight line screen. Huh. So I had a kind of a historical thing that I was playing with and, you know, to keep me interested in printing. That's just so nerdy. It's so great. There's a lot of nerdy printing stuff in here. Yeah, I love it. Um, okay, five okay. minutes. All right. Yikes. All right. Well, in a way, that's okay. That segues to my last part, but we would have to really speed it up to get there. So, I mean, just maybe I'll just show a little bit more, and then. So another way that the, the book is, I think, spectacular is in all the ways it finds, and I'll just show these and then we can talk about them, I won't comment on them, all the ways it finds to integrate text and image. So, um, as I said, it isolates objects in the, in, within the photographic space, treats them as icons, or literally lifts them out of photographs and mixes them with text as signs. It, carves out space within photographs to allow text to populate that space. It reproduces text as, as photographed. It carries color over from, you know, from photographic to typographic um, compositions. It treats both text and image in this sort of zonal way. It finds other typographic ways to mimic in this case, this reminds me of what Amaranth was saying about text and textile and weaving. It floats text in, within photographic space. I mean, this is what I mean about getting psyched out by how inventive this book is. There's just, it's just so um, prolific in its ideas. Um, and this, this is really, you know, so if you actually read the book, there are all these ways in which the text um, cross-references the images and kind of imbricates point of view with, of one and the other so that, you know, this text refers to that image and has the effect of con contextualizing that image within the temporality of the text. So, um, I'm going to skip to this. Was, I, I mentioned incursion. I think one big incursion was that explosion of the tank in the middle of the um, book. This is, this is another form of incursion that I think just works incredibly well. So it's another form of sort of integration of, of text and, and in this case text and typography that something um, which in syntax would be called parallel construction um, and in typographic terms would be called alignment, that those two things are used in concert typographic alignment and parallel construction several times in the book and what they make possible among other things so this is kind of what you're saying what you found was not a terrorist stronghold but just people trying to live their lives right so on the right you have that that impression it's just it's just people it's just you know and on the left you have the text um, about what it's not it's not a terrorist stronghold and eventually one text uh, transgresses the space of the other. Anyway, I found this super effective, and it's just rare to find um, such intricate and sophisticated use of typography as, as a kind of elaboration of writing. Okay, so we got like one minute left. Okay, one minute, Steve. Um, one minute, um, Cliff. You mentioned your interest in that first version of process color that was whatever that straight straight angle screen or whatever. Yeah, straight line screen. Straight line screen. 
But I know that one of the main things that you revived in the book in terms of historical printing techniques is chromolithographic um, techniques that, that built up complex color through discrete color, with what we now call spot color. Right. And then in fact, the, the, the book is printed from a bunch of individual colors rather than CMYK. So I want to talk to you about that, and maybe we can just take a couple minutes to hear Cliff talk about that. So this is, this is printing geekery mostly, but uh, since the overall, the biggest metaphor for me was this idea of a rug and people weaving rugs and weaving itself, and the text is a, uh, a weaving. I wanted to think of a print production technique that's somehow related to that. So in rugs, when you're knotting a rug, use individual colors, and the only blending that happens is optical blending. Uh, CMYK is a kind of monoculture so much printing happens in that color space that it feels like an impoverished experience. And as a, somebody who works in lithography, I was interested in the history of lithography. So I wanted to do a project where the printing itself mimics the labor of rug knotting, uses color in a similar way, and points backwards into a different color space. Any book I make has its own color language, so the color language for this book was built up of these, uh, mostly, most, most of the pages are between six and eight colors. Uh, several blacks, grays, and it hovers between an actual color image and a monochrome image because it's, there's not very much saturation in it. What you can't see in the slides is the red and the yellow uh, are 50% fluorescent pigments. Oh, no so, wonder. So if you, uh, if depending on how much UV light is in the source you're viewing it in, you get a very different experience of the colors. Huh. So it actually sort of glows day glow if you put wow. a UV light on it. Uh, but in normal room light, you wouldn't see it, unless you wouldn't see anything, but under fluorescence, you'd see something. And it makes the reds and yellows pop. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to say how frustrating it is to yeah. get so... I only got through the top surface of things I wanted to talk to you about. Me too. Work. We had too much. Me too. Well, it was because your book is so rich. It's so dense. And that's what makes a book a unique experience in art, isn't it? It's this kind of ability to have great complexity in a very small package. Yeah, I agree. I, I recommend um, buying Cliff's book if it's still I in print. Her book. No, no, I seriously do. He, he, yours is actually way less costs way less than it should. It's totally, you know, affordable by most measures, and you could spend and you should spend several days Very looking fun. at uh, Cliff's book. Anyway. Thanks. All right. All right. Do you? You, you first. first, Cliff. You first. No, you're so I, I master dummies. sequence. I don't put it up on the wall at all. I actually make dummies and I look at it because I'm very interested in the book as a physical experience. Mm -hmm. How about you? Um, yes, I do build dummies. Yes, I do spread things out on the floor as well, especially when I'm, when I'm composing because I, I often like cut and paste, so that I'll spread stuff out, you know, try, so I can move stuff around and see where it should go. But when I want to see, you know, how it's working, then, yeah. Than a dummy. We didn't even get to talk about the incredible grid structure in that book. <laughs> Other uh, questions? Yes? Cliff, how did you end up in Georgia as opposed to any other place? Uh, so I, I had a friend who moved to Moscow in 1990, and I started going to Russia in the early 90s. I got really interested. And the only good food you could get in Moscow in those days was Georgian food. <laughs> uh, Georgian food is fantastic. So I met these Georgians, and they seemed like the opposite of Russians. You couldn't couldn't be more different than Russians. They were happy, they loved life, they had delicious food, all the things that are opposite of Russia. <laughs> so in 2002, I, a friend lent me an apartment to Tbilisi, a Russian guy I knew, who was a Georgian living in Russia, and I went down there, and it was, um, I thought, this is a really weird place. And so I went back several times. I had a Fulbright there in 2003, 2004, and I was there during the revolution that year. <laughs> sacrificial speaking of um, sacred uh, rights it's pretty it's a pretty harsh thing to do to to type to put it face down on a uh, on a press so you have to 
I, I didn't, I only did that, that scheme, the, the, the one abstract version, that's only on the, um, bef you know, before the book begins. I, I only did that once. Um, but yeah, I pretty much said goodbye to that type is what happened. But what a rich metaphor for printing, right? <laughs> I mean, I, t the question was, is really like, you know, ty type is metal, but it's relatively soft. And um, yeah, if you put it face down, it takes a beating. So, still, I can't help it though because it's one of the one of the most efficient and sort of expressive ways to show the system, to show the kind of microgrid that letterpress is um, based on. Other questions? Yes. Cliff's book has a felt wrapper in the deluxe edition that is printed how? Uh, it's UV Cure inkjet. It's a five color. It has opaque white and the other colors. Uh, it actually explains the real story of the book. I was in uh, the eastern province of Georgia with, on a Soros Foundation grant with two other colleagues from a uh, place I used to work, Melissa Potter and uh, Miriam Scher. And we were going around to uh, communities of women felt makers and teaching them book arts. So what we were interested in is if you show people how to make book structures in felt, what are they going to make? And that was sort of interesting. And we had gone into Pankisi Valley actually looking for felt makers. And I was, wanted to go there because I tried to go there in 2002 and was told it was full of Al-Qaeda fighters and I'd be dead if I went there. So, there was, so the felt wrapper points back to the origin of the story. Yes. Yeah, it's funny because um, I said, oh, I'm not going to make another book about a city or city, urban conditions, I'm gonna do this thing that's much more interior, but all the images, all the sort of context of that, uh, the text is, is urban, absolutely. So it's just like inevitable, I guess. Um, yeah, the images in, in the book are from um, New York, um, Berlin, uh, Chicago, um, I can't remember, London. So multiple cities. Um, and the backdrop in the text is definitely, you know, occasionally there are, um, the city um, is referred to in the text, but I'm not sure what else to say about that, except, oh, I know what to say about it, that the, that the f destruction of Jerusalem in the Lamentations in the Old Testament was used, when it, when it shows up as the text for these, um, uh, for lessons of darkness, which really are about commemorating the death of Christ, that's because the the Catholic Church used that image of the forsaken city as allegorically. So those are completely metaphorically used when they get used by Christians, right? And and I guess the thing to say about the city in in this book is it's similarly figurative. Because it doesn't, again, the, the, the text is really in, interior, so anything, um, anyway, so I guess it's, it shows up not so much as the subject of the book, but as a kind of meta various metaphors for what the book is about. So I thought this page read was about the city and dark, falling into darkness. Yeah, I mean, the, it's definitely about a grid of darkness. I think, it, I mean, the grid and the kind of, um, in this case, so the grid was determined by the, in part by the music, so the, the, the width of, the, of a measure. We didn't get, I didn't get into it because it was too boring, but basically an eight, eight pikas was the measure of that typographic musical structure. So that, that generates, you can see those dark lines on the side, the thin lines, those are sort of mark that measure. And then these wood blocks create this second grid. And one of the reasons I think I wanted two grids creating these sort of incidental um, intervals in between, like you see the light lines and the dark lines on the side. Those are these two, this overlay of two different grids. And I think really it's about sort of everydayness and how many structures, how many systems um, are overlaid in any given moment of everyday life. It's different schedules, different, you know. So yeah, it is about urban conditions, but also just about contemporary, you know, time uh, and how how many, yeah, how many structures of dailiness we're in at any given moment. So what about you, what about the, the rural? What would you say about the rural 
context of your book. I'm much more interested to hear you talk about the grid, actually. <laughs> Mm. You are maybe the only letterpress printer I know who has the courage to print photographs. Mm -hmm. Letterpress. <laughs> I've been doing it a long time. And, I keep uh, doing it. Yeah. No, ma no matter really, how murky they are. You're getting really good at it, actually. Um, I wonder why you persist with that. You are a, a, actually a letterpress purist. That's your medium. Yeah. Um, I, l I love... Um, I'm, how can I say this? I think it's just that there's nothing that I w want more to share the page with type than a photographic image, and I'm a letterpress printer, so that just requires... I mean, the first time I printed photographs with type, I printed cyanotypes. I was like, how can I get photographic images onto the paper that I'm printing on? Well, I could treat the paper, and so that I could expose it. That was like a, a nightmare. Um, beautiful, really uh, precise, tiny cyanotypes. But, um, but basically, yeah, I've always had that desire for that combination of photography and um, typography. And the good news is, for the most part, I love the murkiness of, you know, old, messy, you know, you look at a magazine from 1959 and you get this kind of muddy, murky fo color photography. I still kind of love that. So it works for the most part aesthetically for me. I mean, in this case, I think the maybe one thing to say is there's a real contrast, you can't tell in the slides, between that line art, yeah. which is super precise. I mean, there's nothing, that, I mean, letterpress is, can be super sharp with a line. There's, nothing can beat it, really, in the cleanness of uh, if, you're, if you can print decently. Um, and then four color photographs, on a relief process, like it's just it's a recipe for mud. So I think I was interested in that contrast, that formal contrast between sharp and murky. Yeah. It's one but of the at things. At the same time, to get it that beautifully murky, it's a masterful printing. It's difficult to print color photographs, especially letterpress. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm not. Um, I taught a workshop once in color, in process color printing for letterpress, actually in Chicago. Yeah. And Brad Freeman, who was like running the shop there, was like, this is crazy. You, what are you doing? Why are you leading, misleading this group of people who've signed up for your workshop? And I thought it worked out great. So anyway. Other questions? Well, I think we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. Thank you all. We could go on. Thank Thanks. You. So pl please be sure to come back next year for the next one of these. But in the meantime, be sure to check out the, Logan gal the gallery upstairs with the recent uh, acquisitions from the Logan collection. Uh, tomorrow will be the last day that exhibit up is up, and there's some great work in it.